well, some news on the amateur standout turned professional contender, Sofia Ochagava. IBA light welterweight champion, Sofia Ochagava, 3-0 with 1KO, who came back to the ring this March after four years off from the ring, will continue her quest for another fight with bitter rival, Katie Taylor. The next step is tentatively set for October 23rd as part of the Art Tour Better Be vs. Adam Dinez showdown. The date of October 24th is another possibility. She was quoted as saying, If the pandemic situation is fine, I'll fight either in Moscow on October 23rd or on October 24th in Kazan. We are considering options now, but Yulila Kitsenko seems to be a front runner. It'll be for one of the WBA belts, said Ochagava to the media. Ochagava is a three-time European, 2005, 2007, and 2009, and a two-time world, 2005 and 2006 champion, who lost a narrow 8-10 eight eight. decision to Taylor in the final of the 2012 London Olympics. You know, in reading this article, I thought it's strange that they called Sophia a light welterweight, a junior welterweight, essentially, a 140-pound fighter. Sophia having never fought at that weight as a professional. She's fought as a super featherweight and she's fought as a lightweight, but never a super lightweight or junior welterweight. She's never fought at 140 pounds as a professional. They called her a light welterweight. I also thought it peculiar that, at least according to Sophia, she's going to be fighting for some version of a WBA title, even though her name doesn't appear in their rank standings at either 126, 130, 135, or 140 pounds. It's nowhere in there. Even more curious is that the light welterweight version of the WBA title has since gone vacant. The version of the title that used to belong to Jessica McCaskill, the then unified light welterweight champion, currently the undisputed welterweight champion. It seems that both of her titles are now up for grabs. Chantel Cameron supposed to be fighting for the WBC title in the very near future, and it could be that the version of the title Sophia is talking about could be the 140 pound version of it even though her name doesn't appear in the wba's rank standings that's the look of it and perhaps that's one way you can reconcile these comments and these rank standings it's just that well sophia says yulila kutsenko is the front runner for her next opponent but yulila kutsenko's name doesn't appear in the wba's rank standings at 140 pounds the wba's number one contender at 140 pounds is neither sofia ochagava or Yuli Kutsenko. It's Francis Oshin Diriu. Got Puerto Rico's Melissa Hernandez at number two. Germany's Alicia Kumer at number three. Venezuela's Galen Flores at number four. Sarah A. Ching of Kenya at number five. Jessica Kamara of Canada at number six. Candy Wyatt of Canada at number seven. Sylvia Borbot of Italy at number eight. The very familiar former champion Champion Anais de Sanchez of Argentina at number nine. I mean, you get what I'm getting at here. Neither Sofia Ochagava or Yulila Kuchenko's name appear in the 140 pound rank standings. Yet that's the only vacant title at or around these weights available for someone to fight for. Hypothetically speaking, if this is the version of the WBA title that Sofia Ochagava is talking about, what's the plan? What's the end game here? I'll tell you what I think it is. If, in fact, Sophia is pursuing a Katie Taylor fight in the pro ranks, what she's likely trying to do is become a world champion at 140 pounds because Katie Taylor could make a trip there very soon. Hypothesize that Katie Taylor goes up to 147 pounds for a Jessica McCaskill fight. A rematch. After that fight, Katie Taylor's going to descend because Katie Taylor ain't no fucking welterweight. And it won't be a sharp descent. In all likelihood, if Katie Taylor were to go up to 147 pounds, she'd ease her way back down step by step. She'd likely make a pit stop at 140. Maybe see about becoming an undisputed champion there. Yeah, maybe. What Team Ochagava might be telling themselves is, you know what? Instead of trying to become a mandatory for Katie Taylor at 135, why don't we just win a belt at 140? Become world champions. Give Katie Taylor a reason 
to look in our direction. Maybe that's the game plan. Maybe that is the strategy in play here, because you got this article talking about Sofia Ochagava being a 140-pound fighter. You got Sofia herself saying she's going to be fighting for a version of the WBA title, and the only version of that title that's vacant, the only version of that title that's available for someone to fight for is the 140-pound version of it tell you, if this is the case, if this is what's going on, Sophia ain't the only lightweight that moved up to super lightweight to become a champion. Chantel Cameron moved up. That's what she's doing. That could be the case with Sophia, though there is the matter of the rank standings themselves to reconcile. Sophia's name doesn't appear anywhere on them, though. The WBA is widely regarded as the goofiest sanctioning body of all the sanctioning bodies. So I'm not sure. Maybe that's the version of the title Sophia's talking about. One way or another, time will tell what's next for the amateur standout turned professional contender, Sophia Ochigava. Moving on. I'm sure most of you have heard of this report by now. Wilder injured bicep in Camp Four Fury, says sparring partner Junior Fa. Fa has revealed that Wilder injured his bicep near the end of the camp. The New Zealand boxer was not under the impression that the injury would play a role in the outcome. Yes, it was the bicep injury that he suffered in camp. I don't know the extent of the damage, but he did hurt it. Yeah, Fa told Sky Sports. After suffering the loss to Fury, Wilder underwent bicep surgery, which confirmed that there was an injury, but it wasn't clear if it was a pre-existing or sustained during the fight. I was very shocked by the Wilder defeat. The lead-up and the training was actually really good. Deontay was looking great. I think he did hurt himself towards the end of the camp, which I don't think would have played too much into the fight, but then I don't really know the extent of the damage of the injury that he sustained. What I do know is that he did get injured, but I was very surprised by Fury's game plan. As soon as the fight started, and I saw Fury not really taking a backward step, trying to push Wilder to the ropes, I was thinking, oh man, this is going to be a hard night for Wilder. Fury just basically did what he said he was going to do, which was stop the biggest puncher in the world. That was a very, very good performance from him. Now in truth, I don't know what to make of this recent revelation as far as Wilder's torn bicep. For years here on the channel, I talked about how, you know, Wilder is a more injury-prone fighter than people realize, and that over the years, he's had something like seven surgeries. This would be the eighth. So it's entirely possible that Deontay Wilder did, in fact, injure his bicep, tear it, and the buildup to the Tyson Fury rematch. That's not far-fetched at all. I just wonder why this is the first that we're hearing of this. You know, since that fight, we've had most every explanation and to some, every excuse in the book as far as why Wilder lost the fight, the way that he lost the fight, that he was poisoned, that his costume was too heavy, the glove gate fiasco, Tyson Fury's walking into that fight with horseshoes inside of his gloves and shake weights, what have you. And post-fight, it was reported that Deontay Wilder did undergo surgery due to an injury. But what we didn't know, at least what wasn't reported, is that it could have been a pre-existing injury that he suffered in the build-up of the fight as opposed to during the fight. But what if it was in the build-up? What difference does that make? Does that actually change anything? I mean, from where I'm sitting, it only confirms what I've been telling you guys for the last three years. Deontay Wilder is an injury-prone heavyweight whose body is breaking down, and the reason for it, root cause of this might be Deontay Wilder's poor form when he throws punches, as well as repeated use of the same punch. You know, Deontay doesn't have a wide variety of shots he throws. He doesn't have a compact left hook or a tight uppercut. He's got one money punch, the same money punch that he uses to win most every single fight. The big right hand. His limitations as a boxer, as far as skill, coupled with his thin frame, his physique. You know, Deontay Wilde is plenty statuesque for a heavyweight, but what he's not is beefy. He's actually a bit on the thin side as far as today's era of heavyweights go. He often sacrifices quite a few pounds to what are stockier, sturdier fighters, and this could result in repeated injury. I mean, I don't rule out that Deontay Wilder could have got injured 
leading up to the Tyson Fury rematch. I'm just wondering, okay, why is that relevant today? Why are we hearing about this now? Why is it making headlines? And what difference does it make? And why are we hearing about this from Junior Fa as opposed to Wilder himself? That if this injury did affect his performance, his ability to perform, then it should be coming from Wilder himself as he would be the one that knows. Not his sparring partner. I can believe that the guy got injured leading up to the fight. That's not far-fetched at all. It's just that so what? What difference is that supposed to make here and now? What am I supposed to make of it? Doesn't change anything. I don't know. It just all feels a bit strange. I mean, we knew that Wilder underwent surgery post-fight, but here post-fight, months later, we're hearing that this might have been a pre-existing injury that he suffered leading up to the fight. But we're not actually hearing it from him. We're hearing it from one of his sparring partners. Why didn't we hear this from Junior Fa weeks ago? Months ago? I don't understand. It almost feels like his performance, his ability to perform, or the lack thereof, is trying to be explained away with this recent revelation, which, in all actuality, isn't much of a revelation at all. Okay, the injury happened in the buildup of the fight as opposed to during the fight. What difference does it make? He's still lost, though, right? Right. Now, I don't recall hearing that Wilder suffered any injuries in a feist fight, yet that's a fight that a lot of people think he lost as well, just in a different fashion. Essentially, what I'm getting at is that this news doesn't change my view of what took place. It doesn't alter my perspectives and my perceptions of what happened, whether Wilder got injured in the fight or leading up to it. One way or another, it all results in the same goddamn fucking thing. And that this isn't coming directly from Wilder. That post-fight, what Wilder had to say about it, per the reports, was that his costume was too heavy. He made no mention of his arm or tearing a bicep or some kind of injury that prevented him from fighting the kind of fight that he wanted to fight that... This stuff really isn't even coming from Wilder. Yeah, I don't know, man. Guess what most resonates with me is a question, a simple question. Okay, what fucking difference does that make? It's what I find myself asking myself in light of this recent revelation, if you even want to call it that. And finally, we must address last night's fight, last night's controversial outcome, controversial to some, not so much to others. The Jamel Herring versus Jonathan Oquendo fight. And just, you know, what the hell happened there? Did Jamel Herring quit? Jamel Herring post-fight was quoted as saying, Sitting in a hospital alone while being called out with all sorts of negativity is something else. I'm not angry. I'm not sad. Just in deep thought. I will still fulfill my obligations against Frampton, but that fight may be my last. Lost too much time from my family as it is. The WBO super featherweight champion went on to post a screenshot of a medical report, caption that reads, no fractures or broken bones, but the doctors pretty much said I had an old broken bone from a facial injury that never properly healed, resulting to the issue with my vision. But overall, I'm just glad to walk out on my two feet. It just got ugly. I wasn't too satisfied with my performance, to be honest with you. In the beginning, everything was going real smooth with me boxing. I put him down with an uppercut. We knew he was going to come in head first. We had to time it. In the end, I wasn't happy with how I was looking. I'm disappointed with the outcome. I've never been in that situation. Now, having watched the fight and cross-referencing the comments made post-fight by the fans, I didn't get the sense that Jamel Herring did what Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. did with Daniel Jacobs or that Jamel Herring did what Guillermo Rigondeau did in the Vasil Lomachenko fight. I didn't get the sense that this guy quit, that he found himself between a rock and a hard place and he just didn't want to be there. These repeated headbutts from Jonathan Okendo, who was doing very little boxing throughout the course of this fight, just rushing in headfirst in a straight line, and not getting very much work done outside of headbutting Jamel Herring. Oh, granted, he was closing the gap. He was just going about it in a very haphazard way. Made things awkward. Though awkwardness isn't exactly scoring criteria for scoring around or winning a fight. This was a classic case of the finesse fighter versus the scrapper. Eva Brotnika versus Edith Soledad Matisse almost immediately came to mind as I watched this fight with Eva 
fulfilling the role of the finesse fighter, the defending champion, the same way that Jamel did. Though I will say Jamel exhibited much more effective boxing and cleaner work than Eva did in that instance. It was, however, the same dynamic. The finesse fighter versus the scrapper and how those scrappy come-forward fighters that exhibit a lot of toughness can make things very awkward and uncomfortable for the finesse fighter because they're not fighting on the finesse fighter's terms. That's what we saw last night with Oquendo and Herring. This guy wasn't jabbing or double jabbing his way in. He wasn't slipping and sliding past Jamel Herring's jab to close the gap. Put simply, he was coming forward in a straight line, head first, and that resulted in several clashes of heads, which impaired Jamel Herring's vision. That's what it was. Myself, I still had Jamel Herring up on the cards. I still had him winning the fight, though it was a bit awkward. He was still the fighter in the fight, exhibiting the cleaner work, and that's what you're scoring. I will say that I think Jamel Herring's timing was a bit off. He wasn't able to assert himself and keep Jonathan Oquendo out, and he wasn't able to maintain distance effectively. That has to do with Jamel's legs. Taking that half step back. To give yourself enough room to fire a shot that actually has some mustard on it as the guy's coming forward to thereby amplify the damage it causes. I don't think Jamel Herring's legs were quite under him last night, and that lended itself to the overall difficulty of dealing with this very scrappy and awkward fighter, Oquendo. Perhaps it was the time off, the repeated camps in preparation for this fight. You know, this thing was postponed two times prior to it actually going down. That coupled with a very awkward fighter that has an awkward style that he's willing to catch one on the chin coming through the front door just to close the gap. Though once he does, he's not actually getting very much done. He's just falling in and diving into a clinch. He's doing it head feist. And even if Jamal was having a bit of a rough night, bit of a rough patch with Oquendo, the cleaner work really was coming from Jamal. Mal, difficulty or no difficulty, and that's what you're scoring, the cleaner work. I myself am not in a rush to cost harsh judgment over the WBO Super Featherweight Champion's vision being impaired and rendering him unable to continue. I ain't the one getting hit. Even if ex-pro boxers, ex-world champions like Tim Bradley and Miguel Cotto might jump to that conclusion, I myself choose to maintain a bit more reserve with fighters like Patrick Day and Maxim Dadashev in mind. Lest we forget, that was just last year. A lot of boxers were dropping like flies because that's how dangerous this sport is. I didn't get the sense that Jamel did what Julio did with Danny or what Rigo did with Loma. Mel was actually winning the fight. Whereas those two guys mentally checked out. My take on it all, my diagnosis is, if all Jonathan Oquendo could do last night cause several clashes of heads throughout the course of the match, then yes, you might as well stop the goddamn thing before he causes Jamal Herring more serious injury. It's not like Oquendo was winning anyway. Oh, I'll admit, it wasn't Jamal Herring's best showing, but it certainly wasn't Jonathan Oquendo's best showing either.